A ruckus over RIFRA. Speaker Ralston's Pastor Protection Act passes the House unanimously, but Senator Josh McCoon, who's been pushing his own RIFRA bill for three years, calls it a cheap political trick. In the aftermath, a full-blown feud erupted between McCoon and a Ralston staffer. We'll hear more about it tonight from the senator himself. Lawmaker starts right now. Welcome to Lawmakers and Day 21 of the 2016 legislative session. I'm Bill Nygut. If you like your politics served up with a little drama, today should be to your liking. We have a lot to talk about this evening, starting with Shelby Lynn's Capitol report. You had a really interesting day down there under the dome, didn't you, Shelby? Thanks, Bill. Good to see you after the four-day legislative break. It definitely was an interesting day under the gold dome. Last week, we told you about Senator Josh McCoon's opposition to the Pastor Protection Act, which passed in the House on Thursday. Now McCoon is demanding House Speaker David Ralston fire his chief legal counsel, Terry Chastain. McCoon accused Chastain from the Senate floor today of trying to intimidate him for opposing the bill. Shortly after delivering my speech Thursday, while speaking to someone in the hallway right outside this Senate chamber, I was accosted by the Speaker's legal counsel who used language that I cannot and will not repeat in the well of this Senate. His public and profane rant was clearly designed to deliver a message. Keep your mouth shut. The Speaker's counsel should apologize, not to me, but to this Senate body for his profane, rude, and totally unjustified conduct. He should resign his position immediately. Taxpayers should not be subsidizing the intimidation of elected members of this body. If he refuses, then the Speaker should immediately dismiss him with apologies to the Senate. Now, uh, Senator McCoon demanded that you apologize and that you fire Mr. Chastain. I, I don't really have any comment about anything that uh, any other member has to say. I am really busy over here in the House uh, doing the work that the people sent us down here to do. I really haven't had time to get into helping other members of the General Assembly uh, uh, get attention and publicity, which seems to be what some people are focused on rather than working. Meanwhile, as you know, Bill, Senator McCoon's Religious Freedom Restoration Act is still tabled in a House committee. But you're in a great position to dig into this a little deeper because we know Senator McCoon is a guest on Lawmakers tonight. New support today for the expanded medical marijuana bill sponsored by Representative Alan Peek. A group of parents and activists held a rally here at the Capitol. Their focus today was on Governor Nathan Deal, hoping they could win his support. Is he in his office? He's in a meeting. In his office? In a meeting. This group of parents and children tried to see the governor today with copies of petitions in hand. They say the petitions contain 12,000 signatures in support of HB 722. That's the bill that would expand medical marijuana legislation to include grow operations and more covered illnesses. Earlier in the Capitol Rotunda, Representative Alan Peek promised the group of parents and activists he would keep fighting. These are the citizens that are worth fighting for. These are the citizens that HB 722 is designed to provide a safe, legal, lab-tested medical cannabis product so that they can have a better quality of life. Even if just for one day it makes their life better, it's worth it. Dozens of parents and their children were there to support the bill, including two parents of autistic children who are begging lawmakers to act now. Governor Deal, if you don't think that there's families who need this medicine, come to my house. I'll set up a dinner. Come to my house. Come visit with other parents with children like mine. Hear our stories. See the videotapes and the pictures of the before. We'll show you the after. We'll show you how it can help. I'm asking you, inviting you to my home. Every day, myself and my wife have to live with the fear and the question, is today going to be the day? Is today going to be the day that the governor and the legislature force us to become and commit a felony to care for my son? Right now, Peake's bill is still in committee, waiting for a vote that would send it to the House.
debate, but no action is expected on the measure this week. News under the Gold Dome today, a Senate committee voted in favor of a plan that would prevent cities like Atlanta from hiring private companies to enforce parking. The resolution is sponsored by Atlanta Senator Vincent Fort, who says he's tired of hearing complaints about Park Atlanta. Private companies like Park Atlanta are hired to check the meters, write tickets, and often boot cars that violate parking laws. Senate Democrat Vincent Ford is proposing a constitutional amendment to ban local governments across Georgia from using third-party companies to enforce city parking ordinances. The fact of the matter is that when you combine parking enforcement with the profit motive, you get a predatory product, and that's what Park Atlanta has presented. It's victimized citizens, visitors to the city, and small businesses, restaurants, who are losing customers because of their predatory and abusive practices. Fort says there are just too many complaints about the company to ignore residents' concerns. Booting people before time is up, ticketing people, exorbitant fines, a difficult appeals process. It's time to boot Park Atlanta, and that's what my bill would do. Senate Resolution 809 would boot Park Atlanta. Fort says city and or county employees need to be the ones responsible for parking violations. This is law enforcement. And law enforcement ought to be done by governments. You know, we can hold elected officials accountable. It's difficult to hold Park Atlanta accountable. They've even, from what I'm told by the state patrol, they've even ticketed state patrol cars. That's crazy. But again, Senate Resolution 809 is a constitutional amendment. It would need a two-thirds majority vote in the Senate and then the House. And then it would be up to voters to decide if private companies could still be hired to enforce local parking laws across the state. Finally tonight, Bill, should Georgia have an official state dog? Members of the House think so. They voted unanimously in favor of a measure to name adoptable dogs as the state dog of Georgia. The point of the legislation is to help encourage the of dogs that wind up in shelters all over the state, giving these canines a second chance at a loving home. That's it from us at the Capitol, Bill. Back to you in the studio. All right. Thanks so much, Shelby. Okay, we do have an awful lot to talk about uh, here tonight. So I'm pleased to welcome Representative Taylor Bennett. He's a Democrat from Brookhaven. He's back for his second appearance on the show. We're glad to have you here, Thanks Representative Bennett. And the lawmaker has been making an awful lot of news right now, Senator Josh McCoon from uh, Columbus. Uh, to piggyback off Shelby's Capitol report, let's just jump right in to the Pastor Protection Act incident. Uh, first, let's get everybody up to speed on what happened. Um, last week, Senator McCoon took a point of personal privilege to oppose the Pastor Protection Act, which was championed by House Speaker David Ralston. Afterwards, Senator McCoon says that he was essentially accosted by the Speaker's legal counsel. And today, as you heard in Shelby's report, he called for the resignation or firing of uh, Mr. Chastain. So um, let's take a look again at what Speaker Ralston had to say about all of that. I really haven't had time to get into helping other members of the General Assembly uh, uh, get attention and publicity, which seems to be what some people are focused on rather than working. So we're just going to continue working here. Uh, I think that's what people want us to do uh, and, and, and working on what's important and what's going to improve the lives of our young people and our families all across Georgia. And I think uh, that's my focus and that's going to continue to be my focus. So, Senator, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here Certainly. tonight. Um, could we go back a step and let's talk about why you felt the Pastor Protection Act uh, was a, a, a bill that uh, required you getting up in the well and, and calling it basically political trickery? Well, there's a lot of confusion over this issue. You know, we've talked about the number of bills that are out there. Um, even the supporters of this bill in the House debate said, you know, this is to provide reassurance. I mean, they, they were making it clear it didn't really do anything from a legal standpoint. You called it a politician protection act from the well. That, that, that's exactly <laughs> right. And that's what it's designed to do. It was designed to be a, a piece of legislation to vote for that you could put in a direct mailer, that you could talk about back home and say, look at what I did for religious freedom without really doing anything. As I said, the best thing about it was the name. And, and, and um, in the meantime, your SB 129, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a measure which you're now working on your third session to get passed, 
is in, sort of in suspended animation over in the, in the House Judiciary Committee, where there doesn't seem to be any enthusiasm about bringing it out anytime soon. That's right. Uh, you know, Chairman Willard said he wasn't going to consider any Senate bills until day 31. Interestingly enough, uh, last week he did consider a Senate bill on garnishment. So obviously there's some things that, that he does want to move that are, that are Senate bills before day 30. Uh, so it's, you know, right now it's just it's sitting there in judiciary. We'd love to be able to have the opportunity to move it forward. Okay, I do want to talk about the incident that caused and sparked all of this uh, back and forth. But before I do, why is um, 129 more meaningful than the Pastor Protection Act? Well, and it's not just 129. You know, uh, Representative Setzler has a bill. Sam Teasley, Representative Sam Teasley has a bill. Senator Greg Kirk has a First Amendment Defense Act. There are plenty of substantive religious freedom measures to choose from. But again, both proponents and, and people that are, are kind of against these religious freedom measures all agreed the Pastor Protection Act really does not do anything. Let me get you into this, Representative Bennett, and then we'll talk more about this incident. But um, you voted for, as most members of the House did, the Pastor Protection Act. I'm assuming that, like a lot of Democrats, particularly in the House, you're not eager to see any of the other uh, religious freedom bills go forward? Uh, no, absolutely not. And <clears throat> to be clear on exactly what happened in the House Judiciary with the Pastor Protection Act, you know, I sit on that committee, went through our subcommittee, came into the full right. committee. Um, and I, I really would like to commend uh, the Speaker's leadership on that bill, uh, and also the bipartisan nature that actually was undertaken to get the bill in the, in the form that it was at when it left us and went to the, went to the floor. We had, you know, Representative Welch, Representative Evans, Representative Fleming. We all worked together to come up with language for the third section of that bill, so everybody was comfortable with what, you know, the bill, uh, you know, was was doing. And and that to me was a, a really great showing of bipartisanship to get something out of committee uh, that traditionally, you know, we were kind of on the opposite sides at the beginning with. Do, does Senator McCune though make a point when he says that this is an effort to blunt? what uh, other people would consider legislation that would go a lot further down the road. Some people saying protecting the beliefs of religious groups. Others would say possibly opening the door for discrimination. Is it at least fair to say that in some ways this is an effort to kind of diffuse the whole thing without, without passing a measure that has a great deal of impact? Um, I think, and Senator McCune and I, we both know where we both stand on this issue. I think any other bill that comes through um, could, in their, in their current forms, uh, specifically, um, you know, the Senate Bill 129 and, and, and the House version and the First Amendment Defense Act, all these bills have um, other elements to it that are really, from my perspective, it could be used in a discriminatory way. Okay. And we designed the Pastor Protection Act so clear um, in a bipartisan effort to prevent that from happening. Okay. And so, that's where we are. I that. apologize. Okay, Senator, so you took the well late last week and you made your comments and you were uh, immediately in the hallway or some time rather soon after um, confronted by Terry Chastain, the, the speaker's legal counsel. Um, we can't even use the words that he said. How would you characterize them, though? I would just say that he was expressing uh, a pretty uh, negative view of me personally and then uh, suggested that I shouldn't be able to criticize any legislation coming over from the House. I think what's important to note, you know, the Speaker talked about working for things for children and families. This incident occurred right by the page desk. Uh, we have lots of young people who are working there. Um, I don't know what kind of example that sets uh, for what kind of legislative process we want to have. I mean, we're going to disagree. Representative Bennett and I disagree on, on this issue. But we can be civil with one another. We can treat each other with a degree of respect. And to uh, come, come over to the other side of the building and to unleash a profanity-laced tirade, I mean, I heard about working. Obviously, there's not a lot of work to be done if he's got time to come over and engage in that kind of conduct. It's just totally inappropriate. It's wrong. Um, and it has no place in a legislative process. So um, do you, is it, so the speaker said in, in the sound that you just heard that he's focused on what he thinks are more substantive matters. Uh, are there more substantive matters? Is this something that really ought to be laid to rest? Do you have any political value in continuing having this debate? I think that there is a toxic culture at the General Assembly. 
Um, I've heard from so many members since this incident occurred saying, this has happened to me. I've had a taxpayer-funded staff member threaten me, uh, speak to me in an intimidating way. Um, it's stifling debate. It's stifling people being able to feel like they can vote their conscience and represent their constituency. Uh, so I think it's vitally important. I think it affects every issue that we're, we're faced with. Do you think there's something new about, are you aware of the kind of toxic environment? You're a Democrat. I mean, you've got Republicans who are running the, the, the show over there. Um, have you had examples of this sort of thing or seen them take place? Well, first of all, I wasn't where I wasn't there. I didn't. No, no, that. I understand yeah. you didn't see that. Yeah. But 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 Senator McCoon saying that there there's a somewhat toxic environment down there. Do you agree with that? I, no, I have not experienced okay. anything of this level uh, now. OK, um, so uh, Senator, do you think this environment is new? I recall back in the old days, uh, Thomas B. Murphy <laughs> really knew how to take people to the woodshed when they didn't get along with him and agree with him. Um, so isn't that just part of what happens day in and day out in the brass knuckle world of politics? And, and you know, I'm not um, naive to say that, you know, you might have a private conversation with, with someone where voices are raised and indelicate language is used. It's a totally different situation when I'm engaged with a con in a conversation uh, with someone at the Capitol with an issue um, where, again, school-aged children are around. Mm -hmm. There's, It's a public setting. And you come in and use language that we cannot use on television. Um, you, you treat someone in an incredibly disrespectful way. And I think it's important, again, to note this was not a member. This was not somebody that's been elected to come down to the General Assembly and represent folks. This is someone that you and I are paying their salary. And so for them to have the time to come over and, and engage in this kind of conduct speaks, I think, to a very negative culture. Um, and again, I've heard from many, many members since Thursday uh, about that experience that they've had. Um, and it's just wrong. We need to send a message that that's not acceptable. Okay. Um, what's going to happen to the Pastor Protection Act when it comes to the Senate? Well, actually, uh, earlier today, the Senate Rules Committee took up the Pastor Protection Act, added Senator Kirk's First Amendment Defense Act to it, and voted it out of committee. So it will be available for action in the Senate later this week. So, Representative Beto, what that means is this bill could probably be heading back over to you all to look at again. But now, instead of just being pastor protection, it adds this First Amendment Defense Act, which a great many uh, critics of the bill think opens a path for for discrimination, particularly against gays and lesbians. This sounds like a real confrontation boiling up. Absolutely. Uh, and I became aware of what happened today with the Senate Rules Committee. Um, and again, I got to reiterate, uh, you know, I was very proud to be a part of a process that was a bipartisan process that got the Pastor Protection Act uh, where it needed to be to get out of committee uh, and pass unanimously in the House. And uh, unfortunately, I, I think that, you know, again, I'm not in the Senate and I can't speak for what happened, but it seems to me that there was it kind of looks a little bit of a, of a politic and a retribution game being played, tacking that on to the pastor protection to send it back over. If I can just And respond. that's how it kind of looks. Um, um, from our you got about a minute to okay. respond. Well, you know, first of all, I want to applaud Senator Greg Kirk from Americas, who's done just yeoman's work on, on the First Amendment Defense Act. He brought all the parties to the table. He was able to say today in committee that the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce supports the language of the bill that was added. Uh, that the uh, Georgia Chamber of Commerce supports the language that was added. Uh, so I think that he is he has really done a masterful job. There was there was good discussion in the committee, um, but I don't believe this at all is any sort of uh, you know political retribution. I think what it is is putting together. Uh, a robust solution for religious freedom that we can all get. So it's interesting to hear what you just said, uh, because I wasn't aware of that. As you, I mean, certainly the Georgia Chamber and the Metro Atlanta Chamber have been arguing that your bill, 129, really shouldn't go any further. So it's interesting to hear you say that at least Senator Kirk says they're now supporting his bill. Um, yeah, I was, I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that in committee today. And, um, you know, so now it will... I would imagine it would move to the floor for a vote here in the next few days. Real quickly, because we have to break. What happens to SB 129? What's your guess? I mean, I think realistically, uh, it it does not look like it's going to move forward. Um, you know, for me, this is not about my particular bill moving forward. This is about advancing the issue of religious freedom. Okay. And, you know, I'm not seeking out uh, any 
any kind of attention. Uh, unfortunately, folks in the speaker's office can't seem to leave me alone. And so All I, right. <laughs> I hope that they'll uh, consider that going forward. All right. Thank you, Senator. Um, we got to take a quick break. We got to hit the pause button, but we'll be back with more lawmakers in just a minute. But how well do you think you know your lawmaker? Representative Michael Caldwell is a Republican from Woodstock representing House District 20. Can you say overachiever? In addition to hand copying the entire New Testament in high school, he earned a college degree in business finance in less than three years. He began his first campaign for a seat in the state house at the age of 19. Caldwell didn't actually get elected until the ripe old age of 23. When he did, that made him the youngest elected state representative in the United States. Panthers. Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were unique. Police jump on you, beat you up. Now we have voices that we're not going to turn the other cheek. We don't hate nobody because of that color. We hate oppression. We wanted the entire community to follow. Tonight at night on GPB. On this date, February 16, 1757, Henry Ellis, a native of Monaghan County, Ireland, arrived in Savannah to replace the very unpopular John Reynolds as royal governor of the Georgia colony. Ellis earned the respect of many colonists, but he was no fan of the suffocating climate. In a letter to a London magazine, he griped that the heat in Savannah was worse than any place on earth. This from a man who traveled to equatorial Africa. Claiming health reasons, Ellis left Georgia in November of 1760. Welcome back to uh, Lawmakers. I'm here tonight with Representative Taylor Bennett and Senator Josh McCoon. All right, let's talk for uh, just a couple minutes. Alan Peak had a rally today in which he is once again trying to call attention to the latest version of a medical marijuana bill. He wants to expand the list of illnesses that would be treated, but of course wants to have limited production here. Where do you think this bill is headed in, and do you support his effort on this? Uh, I absolutely, I support the effort in getting the conversation started. This is definitely something that needs to be explored. Um, you know, I have, uh, there, I know a number of people that could benefit from this type of legislation. Um, but I do also have my concerns about ensuring that um, the limited licenses that could be issued under this legislation, uh, you know, are required to explore all you know ailments that could be potentially benefited from it. I don't want to see. Um, you know, certain ailments suffer from, you know, not research or, you know, uh, investment into helping, you know, certain diseases like sickle cell, for example, uh, that might get left off of, uh, mm -hmm. of the, I guess, the agenda of some of these license holders. So I want to see that be a focal point that we have a full inclusion of the ailments. That but should we have limited production here? Otherwise, people are breaking the law every time they try to bring cannabis oil into the state. It's a, it's a very valid point. Um, the last thing I want to do is have our citizens be forced for a medical reason to commit felonies. Um, at the same time, as, you know, we still need to ensure that um, all the, you know, I guess the regulations and, and the restrictions you know, are, are in place and that everybody's on board, law enforcement, health, everybody, uh, to ensure that we have a a, a good system set up. Senator, uh, a, a lot of law enforcement uh, organizations are against uh, limited production here. And you work a lot with uh, the religious communities, the, the, the conservative religious communities in the state. And I assume there are some real questions <coughs> in their minds about adding production in the state of Georgia, too. Yeah, there's definitely a degree of skepticism out there. Um, you know, I think one of the things that gets missed a little bit in this, uh, in your video earlier, Mike, constituent and friend Dale Jackson was talking about his child who has an autism diagnosis and I tried to amend HB1 in the Senate to add that as a covered diagnosis. I think that's something right. we absolutely have to do. Um, on the cultivation issue, I would just say, you know, we're, we're going to watch very closely as the bill works through the House process and comes over to the Senate. Um, but, you know, everyone is sympathetic to these families and we want to find a, try to find a way to solve this problem. Okay. It will be interesting to see how this goes forward because right now you've got this terrible catch-22. Yes, it's legal to use cannabis oil. It holds out hope. But how do you get it legally? So it's a, it's a dilemma you're going to all have to work out under the gold dome.
Uh, let's turn to uh, a development today that a lot of people were anticipating. There have been rumors for quite a while that uh, Senator Vincent Ford, who denounced that he was a uh, supporter of Hillary Clinton's, might be thinking about changing to uh, Bernie Sanders. Well, Bernie Sanders is right now holding a rally at Morehouse College, and Vincent Ford is right there with him because today he announced he was going to endorse uh, Bernie Sanders. Let's listen to what he said to our Capitol team about why he made the switch. Having the opportunity to read and study uh, Senator Sanders' record uh, and having a chance to look at his positions, his positions, uh, his ideas conform most closely with mine. $15 minimum wage, uh, fighting Wall Street, uh, the predatory lenders, uh, health care, Medicare for all. You know, we're fighting for Medicaid expansion here in Georgia, and there are many other states in the South and in this country that have not done Medicaid expansion. And Georgia would bring 500,000 people onto the health care rolls, uh, Medicare for all. Uh, the Bernie Sanders plan would take that issue off the table. We would provide health care for all who need it. Is that enough to switch your support from Hillary Clinton? Absolutely. Absolutely, says uh, Vincent Ford. Uh, Senator, uh, <laughs> Mayor Kasim Reed is already angry enough at Vincent Ford because of his position on Park Atlanta. Kasim Reed, one of Hillary Clinton's biggest organizers and backers in the state, is not going to be very happy with this either, I would guess, right? <laughs> no, I, I highly doubt it. <laughs> you know, I, I, obviously Senator Ford and I disagree uh, on a lot of issues, but no one can question his uh, his passion and sincerity. I do think it says something interesting about the internal dynamics of the presidential race, uh, that he is moving over to Bernie Sanders. I think that says something about the momentum of the Sanders campaign coming out of New Hampshire. So uh, clearly, we're, we, we know that Bernie Sanders is in town tonight at Morehouse. He's already got young people backing his campaign. 80 plus percent in New Hampshire voted for him. But he doesn't have young African Americans. It's going to be fascinating, isn't it, to watch tonight to see how that group of students responds to him. Yeah, I mean, the presidential campaigns are fascinating in of themselves. You know, it's, there's been so much that's gone on so far, um, and who knows how much change is going to happen in the next couple days. Even. Yeah. So it, it'll be fun to watch. Well, and as long as we're talking presidential politics, you're a Ted Cruz man. Uh, do you imagine that Donald Trump wins South Carolina if the polls are right, but that Ted Cruz is positioned to come into Georgia with a huge organization and make this state his own? I think that Ted Cruz is very well positioned uh, in South Carolina and throughout the South. Uh, I know here in Georgia there is a tremendous volunteer and activist organization uh, that has been working for quite some time now. Big organization. I, I, identifying the vote, getting out the vote. Uh, so we certainly feel, I feel very good about where Senator Cruz is positioned. Um, we imagine that once South Carolina happens on the 20th next Saturday that everybody's heading down here uh, pretty quickly. So it'll be fun to watch. All right. Finally, with the little time we have left, you know, today you all in the House uh, declared an official dog of Georgia. And it's really any adoptable dog, right? Yes. Okay. So how did that happen? I, if you don't mind, I'll explain it. It happened because our colleague, Todd Ream, who is one of our uh, best uh, panelists on our radio show, Political Rewind, is determined to see every dog that needs a home in this state adopted out. And he worked very hard to get this legislation through. So I just want to give him a shout out and congratulate him. Uh, you get to sign off on this next uh, next. I'm sure it will be heading to the Senate quickly, <laughs> and I imagine it will be adopted unanimously. All right. Well, congratulations, uh, Todd, on, uh, on doing a great thing for the unadopted dogs of the state. That's it for day 21 of the session. We have 19 days to go. You know, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at GPB News. You can go to our website, gpb.org slash lawmakers. If you like politics, you'll love Political Rewind. We'll be on at 2 p.m. tomorrow afternoon and Friday at 3 on GPB Radio across the state. It's really a good show, in my humble opinion. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Bill Nygut. We'll see you tomorrow.